This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. really my pleasure to be here with all of you. And we're going to be talking about stress and how you can outsmart that. And we will talk uh, in the end about one breath at a time. Uh, so I want to sort of step back. And, you know, what, it, what brings us to thinking about stress, and particularly stress in women? But much of what I'm going to say also uh, applies to men in our audience. And uh, so this is not really just all about women. Uh, though it's very important that today's world uh, for women does present a lot of challenges. We have pressure to achieve or be active in multiple domains. So what do I mean by domains? I mean, first of all, there's family. There's children or grandchildren. We often have spouses. So there's a, you know, people in our lives that are really important to us, caring for them. Then there's the aspect of home, and many of us are involved in providing food and cooking. And now we don't want to just cook, but we want it to be healthy because you've been taking these wonderful courses here at UCSF in the Minimed that t tells us all about how, you know, what we should be eating. Many of us are also involved in home repairs, you know, especially now that we have the internet. We can look up on the internet how to fix this or that problem. You can just you know, search for, you know, ringing toilet, humming this or that, and then we find ourselves doing that. Then there's work outside the home that can also be a source of stress for people. Um, and work, of course, in, in, there's also volunteer work, which people go into thinking, oh, this is going to be a lot of fun, but you get really involved. And then there's you know, deadlines and things that are really important in that. And then something I always like to add that is relevant to many of us is caregiving. Caregiving for little people, caregiving for our parents, caregiving for partners and spouses and friends. So that also, so all of these domains, and many of you might even be thinking of other domains, this gets to be a lot of multiple roles of work, life, balance, family, and so forth. And so some people can feel overwhelmed by that. So you can just sort of pause and say, oh, do I feel like I have some competing demands? So we'll talk some about that. But let's step back and say, let's define stress. What is stress? And um, you, we could do a whole lecture on how to define stress. But what I'm thinking of here is that it is a specific response by our bodies to a stimulus, something that has happened. And it usually can be involve fear, pain, but it can also be you know, conflict you know, and wanting to please you know, multiple people at the same time, not having enough time. There are all sorts of the things I just described can create stress. And what that does, it disturbs or interferes with our normal physiological equilibrium as an organism. It throws us off. It impacts us. And what it does then, too, is it results in, as you see here, physical, mental, emotional strain or tension. It has an effect on the body. Um, and I like this little, this is a um, little um, zebra going, oh no, I'm losing my stripes. I think it's stress. Some of us feel like we're sometimes losing our stripes too. Now, there have been uh, surveys that have looked at stress um, in America. This is something that is really common now. Uh, in fact, this was a, a survey that was done by the American Psychological Association in 2010. They found that 51% of adults reported that they had moderate levels of stress. It's just over half you know, saying, I've got moderate stress. 24%, you, now you're looking at a quarter, they said the stress was really at a high level. They were feeling a great deal of pressure. Um, the 22% who said their health was poor or just fair, that population uh, was one that reported the highest stress. And this is going to be a theme here, that when people are under more stress, it does seem to be affect, 
it affects our health. And that's one reason that it's something that is really important to those of us who are in the health profession, because we see this. And we'll highlight some of that tonight. And then at the end, we're going to talk about things you can do to manage some of that stress. Um, about 70% of the people were instructed by their providers to make some changes in their behavior, you know, things they might do. But only 35% felt that when they left that visit that they really knew what it was they should do. We're given stress reduction instruction. Some of that makes sense because so many times when we're seeing our providers, there's not enough time to go into that. And I think that's where programs like the mini-med or looking online, there are all sorts of programs now that, can, that you can actually click on um, and search for meditations and ways of coping with stress. So some of that is actually out there, and we'll do some of that tonight. But you, if you think about it, your provider might even mention this if you say you're having some you know, certain uh, physiological symptoms. See if they talk about changes in behavior. Now, these are the common sources of stress, and this is from the survey that they looked at those, and these are kind of ranked ordered. What were the major sources of stress for people? Uh, financial stress is a major player, and this is, of course, in the United States. I mean, we have a lot of people who are, have, you know, food insecurity, the cost of housing, and, you know, um, retirees on limited incomes, the, the whole financial crisis. I think has been a major source of stress for people. Work, the economy, still related to money and so forth, and personal safety um, is, is certainly a major stressor, but not as common as some of the others. Now, here's a news flash, because when I first got into this field, uh, we were studying women and uh, women in the work site and women who you know, had families, so they were trying to do work-life balance, and we thought those women would all be less healthy than women who um, didn't have that kind of struggle. And we didn't find that. And actually, there's a whole area of research on that. Because it turns out, we talked about in those multiple domains of family and work, that multiple roles actually, it can involve role strain, where you've got competing demands. But it can also be health enhancing. So it's, you, don't, you can't necessarily find women who work outside the home as being quote unquote, less healthy than women who are only in the home, but there's lots of reasons for that. Um, one reason is also that sometimes women who are working will decide to stop working and go home. So it, it, they come out of the workforce. So it's an interesting thing. But what really struck us was that if women view the roles that they have as rewarding, and enhancing their opportunities, their opportunities to achieve more, to contribute more. In those cases, that can balance out some of that role strain. So just having multiple domains, as many of you do, that doesn't mean necessarily that you're sort of doomed. It means that there's some work you need to do. What we, where the risk is is where people feel trapped and really caught. That, that's where the risk is found. So then the goal for women and for men is to su successfully weave together multiple threads of responsibility to try to make a good fit. And we'll talk some about that, because if you keep adding more and more and more roles, we can't stretch out the day. And that can cause that weaving together something so there's a good fit to be challenged. Um, so multiple roles. What I think is important can offer multiple opportunities for re rewards, um, more resources, and also opportunities for social support, and it can promote well-being. So it doesn't necessarily, you know, having multiple domains doesn't necessarily mean that a one's in trouble. Now, going back to stress, though, we talked, we defined stress, and since we can't assess it by losing our stripes like the zebra, um, we look at other systems in the body. And what this um, slide shows is that stress actually impacts all of our systems. The nervous system, the musculoskeletal skeletal system. Some of us will find that we get tense in our neck and our shoulder muscles from sitting at a desk all the time and maybe working on computers. Uh, respiratory system, uh, cardiovascular system, the endocrine GI system, you've heard of sometimes people have um, functional bowel disorder. It can really throw off your GI system, immune system, and reproductive system. I'm going to highlight this evening, but we could t do talks on every one of these. We'll talk a little bit about heart disease and women, because it's a major cause of death for um, women in this country. And I'll talk a little bit about inhibited breathing.
and the importance of the breath um, toward the end. So what I'd like to do is highlight a little bit more digging down into uh, one of the stress, one of the effects of stress for working mothers. This is a very interesting survey of a thousand women, and they highlighted something that I think a lot of us don't think about when we're looking at that this slide of the systems, and that is the role uh, that stress can play in sleep, which is really important. Sleep is important for restoring our, our function. There's recent suggestions that um, inadequate sleep can, you know, increase risk of dementia and other things. So sleep's really important. And what they found was working mothers were also using a lot, drinking a lot of coffee. Um, here's a really important thing, the rate of drowsy driving, really a problem. And for um, the 50 plus age group, and I'm in that age group, um, well into that age group, significantly in that age group, beyond that age group, uh, the highest, this is, they were the group that used the highest number of sleep aids. And so sleep is something that's really, really important to enhancing our health. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. Now, I promised I'd talk, I'm going to dig a little deeper into the role of stress and heart disease, uh, because heart disease is, you know, a major killer of women in this country. And we go all the way back to Sir William Osler in 1897, who highlighted something about heart disease. And he noticed that the typical heart disease patient is a keen and ambitious man whose engine is always set at full speed ahead. He said that in 1897. And it's kind of interesting. I and mean, this is sort of a homegrown story here for San Francisco. And that's this um, same characteristic of men became part of Rosamond and Friedman's um, observation of their heart disease patients as what they called type A personality or type A behavior. And we'll talk a little bit about that and how that might relate to women in some of the more recent work. And when they studied type A, they re really boiled it down. It was people who were very time urgent, competitive, um, and had a sort of an uh, irritability or hostility. Those were some of the major coronary prone aspects of type A behavior in men. And this picture is interesting because it was their upholsterer who said to um, Friedman and Rosamond, this is the chairs from their waiting room, and they were at Mount Zion Hospital, which is now part of UCSF, and they were, the upholsterer said, you're, you're the only doctors that have the worn out at the, at the front of the seats. You know, the people that were coming to see them were, you know, sort of ready to pounce, you know, and they, they uh, you know, wanted the doctors to be on time, you know, and they would berate them if they weren't on time. So uh, it was sort of interesting story. And this is actually the picture of the chair from the waiting room that they had at Mount Zion. Uh, they actually did a study after describing this characteristic, and they showed that it did increase the risk of heart disease significantly, the people that, the men that had type A. They did an intervention, a group counseling intervention to have uh, people address these, these behavior patterns and to talk about them in a group, and they showed that that improved cardiac out, outcomes. But all of that work was only done in men. Even though heart disease is a risk factor for women, uh, and, but part of that is that women's um, heart disease risk is somewhat postponed to men's. And so, you know, it's, maybe it's more evident to people. But many of us, when we got into this field, got very interested in studying uh, stress and heart disease and other concerns in women, including myself. So is type A behavior, um, does that increase risk for women? And it turns out that research on, quote, type A over the years expanded. So rather than talk about type A, I'm going to talk about the other psychosocial, psychological, and sociological risk factors that are associated with heart disease. And these actually are in both men and women. The research shows that there really is a set of psychosocial factors that increase risk of heart disease for both genders. And um, we'll, we'll highlight women, but the, the data really are evident. They, they kind of differ a little bit in um, some of the prevalence, but in general, these are areas of concern. Depression, uh, depressed mood, it increases risk for heart disease. These are the ones that they've studied, and I'll show you some of the evidence. Anxiety is one that they've studied, um, anxiety or fear. Um, here's that, remember the hostility, the anger or negative affect. So negative affect, because um, sometimes people are hostile, other times they just experience a negative affect, but they may, some people may not express it. 
Um, they would say, you know, the person looks upset and you would say to the person, you might ask them, you know, how are you? Are you feeling okay? And they go, nothing's wrong. You know, this is called, an, uh, you can even smile, an unfelt smile. I have to practice that, you know, you worry, this, it's totally, you know, I'm fine, thank you. What you're noticing is that my eyes are not engaged in the smile. There's a scientist at UCSF, Paul Ekman, who studies faces, and he taught me how to, that that's what that is. And um, that's when a person is upset, but they're not expressing it directly. Limited, the reason we talk about psychological and sociological is there is also evidence that a limited social network is also related to risk for men and for women. Uh, so limited, that's not having people with whom you, you know, to whom you could turn if there's something that's wrong uh, for you, in, you know, in your life. Let me share with you some of the interesting research that has been done by a colleague. Um, the research I'm going to be describing, it, here's this by Whitaker, and she was working with Christina Orth-Gomer, a scientist in Sweden who has done a phenomenal research uh, focusing on heart disease in women. And one of her studies was the WISE study, Women's Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation Study. And ischemia is the sh uh, sort of a, um, a shortage of blood flow to the heart. And th so that the flow of oxygen to the heart is restricted when the arteries become blocked or you know, are not as open. So there's the, the person will experience this ischemia, not enough oxygen blood flow to the heart. And that's sometimes experienced as there's a pain called angina. And you may have heard about that. So, uh, Dr. Whitaker, or Gomer, and their colleagues found 493 women who've experienced um, what they, based on clinical examinations, they were suspected of having this ischemia. They also investigated in these women and measured their depression, anxiety, negative affect, and whether to the extent to which they had limited social networks. So they could see whether or not these factors were related to elevated risk in this group. So you've got a risk, a group that's already at some risk, and then you follow them over time. So they were followed up an average of 5.9 years in this study. And then they looked at whether or not there's any association between these psychosocial factors and the development of events so a heart disease event would be really a stroke, a myocardial infarction, or with, you know, heart attack, or elevated risk, the development of blood pressure, elevated blood pressure, hypertension, um, weight gain, metabolic syndrome. So they were looking at those associations, but in a longitudinal study, so they're following these people over time. So at the end of 5.9 years, what they found, they had 75 women who had 95 events. So some women had more than one of these events, the stroke, myocardial infarction. And they then created a score, which was what was special about the study, is they actually put these, rather than competing, is it depression or negative affect, they, they were sort of looking for stress. Because some of us can be depressed on one day and then get kind of angry the next day. So they were looking at kind of a combination of these four psychosocial risk factors to see which ones might be associated with those events or the risk. And when they looked at the combination, the combination of the four factors did predict cardiovascular events. Um, in particular, three were more important than the, uh, than the fourth. Uh, depression, the negative affect, and the social isolation or limited networks. Anxiety was not as strongly associated with, um, with the events. They also looked at the four factors and whether or not it was related to um, hypertension, putting on weight. And there, they didn't, they basically, the four events did predict a progression in terms of you know, developing uh, you know, hypertension and so forth, but it wasn't more powerful than the items alone. But they showed that this cluster is something that we need to be concerned about, and particularly as it predicts events in this group over about six years. And that was the WISE study. They, they did some subsequent studies. Um, they also did the, there was a Stockholm female coronary risk study that had a cohort of 292 women. Um, excuse me, that first study, I want to correct myself, that first study was done by a colleague of mine, I, I, it wasn't Dr. Orthgomer, I'm sorry. That was Whitaker and Noel Berry Mers. So if Noel, if she 
sees this lecture. She's at UCLA, and I want to apologize. I, um, I was, uh, forgot that. That's Noel's study. This is Christy Northgomer. She did a similar study, and she was looking at younger women. Um, in her study, she was looking at 30 to 65, again with women who had this unstable angina. Remember, I was talking about ischemia, so a lot like Noel Barry Murs and Whitaker's study. It's chest pain. And she was also looking at women where there was a confirmed MI, women that had had a heart attack between the ages of 30 and 65. That's relatively young for women to have a heart attack. Um, and she followed those women for 4.8 years, looking for recurrence or progression. Does the angina turn into something more serious? Is there a recurrence of heart attack, a second heart attack or another heart attack? She, this sample of the 292 women included women who were married or cohabiting with someone, had a partner. She also looked at women who were working outside the home. And you know, some women were doing different things. So she could look at work stress and what she called marital stress. And what she found that marital stress uh, is associated with an increase of risk that's almost three times. So marital stress is a major source of stress for women. Um, Work stress was also a stressor, but not as potent a stressor as is marital stress or family stress. Um, and you know, she, those were, I, I should check with her to see what if you had both. I would assume it would increase the risk even more. But she was looking at women in, you know, in the environment to see what are some of the stressors. They've gone back and looked even deeper into that study because they initially were just looking at these forms of stress. Did people indicate they had stress in their marriage? Was, how much stress did they have at work? They then went back with, as people started looking at these psychosocial risk factors to say, what's going on with depression? Like in the WISE study that I presented earlier, you know, these people started talking more about depression. So they found that depression you know, was also associated with increased incidents and recurrent events. So if a person's starting to have heart troubles and gets depressed, it can it can accelerate things for them. Um, they also looked at social isolation. And particularly, they found that when you combine social isolation and depression, that was associated with disease progression. And I'll tell you how they did that. The women in the study, what they did, they wanted to study them over those years. And they did repeat um, angiography. So they would go in and actually you know, thread a tube into the coronary arteries and look it, to see whether or not they were becoming narrowed. And they did that at repeat, repeat times. So then they could look to see people at the beginning, if they reported depression and isolation, did the rate at which their arteries become narrow, was that rate greater than people who didn't report depression or so social isolation? And they found that association, that these are these increased risk. And this paper has just come out um, last year. They found that another kind of form of stress, this was a scale called the vital exhaustion scale, which is a combination of being depressed and feeling exhausted. Like just, you know, when I, that early slide we said overwhelmed, where a person's feeling tired, and we will get to the happy part later. <laughs> this is like, oh no. Um, the vital exhaustion is fatigue and depression at the same time and that that was associated also with this disease progression that they measured. So lots of reasons to focus on these psychosocial factors, the negative affect, depressed mood, and being isolated. There was also another study that was published in Lancet. This was an enormous study that looked at 29,000 people. It was a case control study. And that kind of a study is one where they identify people who already, you know, have had um, a myocardial infarction. And so they get, in that study, they had 11,000 or so of those people in 52 countries around the world. And then they identified 13,000 individuals who were matched by age and gender and so forth who didn't have uh, a history of heart disease. And then they compared them. And they, to their surprise, because the author here is a, a colleague I've known, I haven't seen him for some years, but um, Salim Youssef, they, I, you know, dyslipidemia, that's like high levels of cholesterol and lipids, diabetes, smoking. It was rather a surprise that 
this, the, some questions about psychosocial factors actually ranked higher than um, smoking and diabetes in terms of separating those two groups. And you know, I will say too that the reason in science we have multiple studies is that you have to kind of look across studies is you don't want to say, oh, well then it's okay to smoke. No, smoking also carried risk. But it was a surprise, I think, to the medical community that the psychosocial factors would be so high up. What they asked about, well, these were questions that asked about work stress. There was a general stress question. There was a question about financial stress and a question about stressful life events. So embedded in this interview that they did with these people, the, in, in the two big groups, the people that had heart disease and the group that didn't, were these questions. Um, and when they put those four questions together, it kind of surprised them how predictive that was. It increased the relative risk. You're looking at um, you know, sort of a triple risk if a person has a lot of those factors. So now, the question becomes, OK, it, can stress reduction prolong life uh, if for a woman who has had cardiovascular disease? And for the, many of us, we may not have cardiovascular disease, but we want to deal with this. And this is, again, with Christina Earth-Gomer and her team did a study in Stockholm again, a women's intervention trial for coronary heart disease called SWITCHED. And what they did was they randomized uh, it was a randomized trial. They took women, 237 women who'd had myocardial infarction, bypass, had had some angioplasty done. So they've got some heart disease. And they randomized them to basically getting stress reduction or usual care to be followed by their regular physicians. The stress reduction involved groups of women that met, there'd be like four to eight women who would m meet in weekly, it wasn't every week, but it was sort of weeks meetings throughout a year. So about 20 meetings a year. So it was sort of a 20 session intervention, but spaced out over time so that women could get, you know, learn some new skills, practice those skills, come back together, share their results with. And that is not unlike the groups that Friedman and Rosamond and colleagues have done with the studies with men. So these um, were done. The education included. Um, something about risk factors, because you would want to do that. So they did get information about things they should do, their diet, and so forth. Relaxation techniques, which always in, in, involve breathing. Uh, coping interventions for stress, stress with both work and with family. So those were the things that they talked about in the groups. So the question is, did it work? Uh, from randomization to the end of the follow-up, the, and they had the most people were followed for the average mean follow-up was about seven years. A total of 33 women died in that study. Uh, eight in the stress reduction group and 25 in usual care. So you can sort of do the math that that shows that the stress reduction actually had a threefold protective effect for um, the women that entered the study. So we're seeing that, that factor. It's interesting. It sort of goes between two to three um, risk factor. And when they controlled for baseline, you know, there's ways you do adjustments for all the baseline factors. When they did that, it really didn't affect the, the effect that the stress reduction had. It's really an important study. So what we want to turn to in discussing t tonight is how do, you know, how can we try to outsmart stress? And that's what I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about now. And so this is more of a kind of a how-to part as opposed to um, in talking about the science. And what I'm drawing from are things that are in these group interventions that people participated in. And one of the things that is often done is clarifying values, taking time to really think about and clarifying the values in our lives. Um, then there's time management, which is really hard really, really hard for some of us to do. Managing negative moods becomes very challenging. And then we'll talk about breathe. And um, we'll talk about how th that there's an acronym there that is um, some steps that you can follow to change uh, your, maybe some, make some changes in your life that would be health enhancing. But first, talking about clarifying values. This is. Um, a pretty straightforward exercise, really kind of easy to do. 
And that is to answer the question that if I only had five years left to live or one year left to live, how would I spend my time? You know, what would I do? And some of us have unfortunately had friends where, you know, they knew that they didn't have that much time. And many people make changes when that occurs. And I think that that's really informative uh, for us because it, it shows what we really value because time is an incredible resource that we have. You know, and you know, with money, we make investments. We need to make investments with our time. And many of us don't. We think, well, we'll do that later, as soon as we get by this next big phase of the things that we're doing. So the way to do this is to consider, is to you know, draw a circle. And you can do this at any time. And say, if I only had a short period of time, how it, and you make that circle, is that time, how would I divide up what I would do? How much would I keep working? You, some, some, many of us have to work in order to kind of make ends meet, but you know, how much of that would I do? What about myself? What about spending time with friends, family, travel? You, know, you could think about those things and sort of say, and then what you do is step back for a moment and say, you know, this is really where we are today, and how am I spending my time? And many of us, you know, are, are, have this in mind as what we're shooting for, but we often get caught up in as soon as I get past this next deadline. And this, for those of us in academia, it's that next grant or this kind of thing or that kind of thing. So this is a really important thing for us to do. How do we typically spend our time, and are we investing it wisely? That's just something to do that sort of clarify what's important to you, and are you putting your time in those things that are important. Then we really need to turn to how we manage time. Uh, very, very important. Um, and many of us turn to sort of a, um, time management 101, which is not that good. Uh, that be you become an expert on hurrying, uh, and you're really good at it, you know, and multitasking, doing two, three things at a time. Um, and some of us are, you know, we almost pride ourselves at that, um, you know, putting our makeup on, those of us who do that, in the car while we're driving, or phoning, texting, should not do that, it's illegal, um, you know, and, but we do that, we stop at stoplights and you know, just sort of do it down, it's probably even more dangerous to do it down low, um, but this is an example of that, you know, there used to be uh, mail, then we had FedEx, uh, which would get the, then then we had fax machines and that's not fast enough um, now we have we can just do things scan it zip it to people so one thing that I think is happening is that our lives have become have sped up and this is you know there's there, there's just a lot more coming in you know if you're going to communicate with someone in fact some of us use email I can even ask you show of hands how many people use email to communicate and then there's, well, with younger people, they don't do email, they text. And they probably do something even more modern than that that I'm not aware of, you know. But uh, this is the way we communicate now. And it, people really expect that you'll respond, uh, particularly in some work environments, you're, you, know, you really need to look at all your email every day. In fact, people will say I sent them an email and kind of expect to get a response within you know, an hour or so. So we find ourselves, it's very common to be in meetings where people are you know, either openly, like if I was boring, some of you would be doing your email now, um, though I don't know how good the reception is in this room. But, this is, but you see here kind of a, a speeding up of how we, we communicate. Um, so another part of being really good at hurrying is you know where all of the express lanes are in the various supermarkets. And the only thing that can happen, though, is you can be in line with someone who's a little bit more aggressive, and they will count the items in your basket and tell you you should go in the other line. Uh, this is, but this is a part of our lives. We all know where those places are, the self-checkout, where you get really good at it, so that you know, there's, sometimes there are four places but fewer people in line. So that's part of hurrying. Um, so what do we need to do? You know, there's lots of courses you can take on this, or online courses. Some of this is to really begin to download that we're doing too many things. Um, this is something that you know, many of us live with. I live with this too. You, you get asked to do things, and we say yes. 
And we really think about those things. And we say no to a lot of things. But what happens is the yeses accumulate over time. So now you have, and many of us think, oh, you know, if somebody asked you to do something in July, oh, well, you look at your calendar, July looks really open. And so we start making these commitments out there. So some of us, if we're feeling overloaded, it's, it is that, you know, the yeses accumulate. And the other thing to do is we need to try to avoid future overload. So you have to look seriously and begin to say, you know, this has been good, but I think I should download something. You know, I, th this is, you know, I need, I, you know, I'm on these, so many committees. I'm, you know, and it's really interesting that for some people who are very achievement oriented, it's very hard to download because they're, you know, they, they really take pride in doing those things and they don't want to let anybody down and they, they, they can think of other things they could do to make it better. And sometimes if someone else comes in, they come in with all that young fervor and that you're sort of at the tail end of your energy and the next person comes in and might even do it better. Well, why not? You know, and so, but there is this, we need to think about downloading or that when you say yes to avoid future overload, you know, you just added something what could you take off? You know, what can you eliminate from the things that you're doing? These are easy to say, really tough to do. And I know it sounds so simple, but it's really hard. Um, another thing that many people do, particularly who feel anxious and feel behind, is that they want to get a sense that they're doing a lot, that they're getting a lot done. And so they have, there's this idea of, I'm going to clear the decks, and then I'll get to work. And this is a real problem with email. It used to be making your phone messages. But now with email, there it's, it becomes conversations with, you know, like 10 people at the same time. So all time management people will advise, set aside time to do the email. And some people say that's easier to do than, you know, easier said than done. But I think this is a real problem because part of this is to give us a false sense that we're getting a lot done. You know, we're really keeping up with things, crossing things off our lists. You know you're in trouble if you do something and you look on your list, it wasn't there, so you write it down so you can cross it off. You know, some of us do that. Now, how would I know about that? <laughs> uh, but that's what we do. It's, it's sort of a sense of accomplishment. Uh, actually, sometimes people do this because they're putting off doing something they really should be doing that's tougher. And the best time management thing is there's something that's really you're putting off, like writing that tough letter or starting that new paper or that grant that you need to write, is set aside some time and say, I'm going to make myself do this. I'm going to do this for 20 minutes, and then I can answer emails because that's fun. And that will help you get more done instead of saying, I'm going to clear the decks. Clearing the decks can get you through a lot of clearing the decks, and you don't get to the things you need to do. Another thing is to schedule with the real world in mind. I had to come across the city tonight, so I decided rather than work late and then try to do it quickly, I would go early and then I got here and then I would be here if I, you know, and have some free time with no one here yet, I could get the work done. So that way I was scheduling for what can happen when you try to cross San Francisco either by mass transit or by car. I have a colleague here, I won't identify this person, who puts on her running gear, puts her work on her back, and she runs. So she can do it probably faster than any of us. It's, you know, it's two and a half miles or so across our city. So you, we really need to schedule planning for um, road work, long uh, lines, places, because then you don't get that anxious feeling where you're running, 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 hurry, 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 and then uh, you, you have to wait. And it also interferes when you're caught up in this hurry thing. It interferes with the social networks because it means when somebody calls you, you don't have time. Or for, for those of us who work in healthcare, you know, it's, it's having that little bit of extra time to say hello to someone. Uh, and I know clinicians who see a patient, and, you know, the, the patients may have been waiting a long time or just hoping to catch them for a second. And if we're running, 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 we don't have time to take a few minutes with that person. Or we do that, and then we find ourselves, now we have to run, run, run to catch up. And we're, we tend to live really kind of cutting the margins. So scheduling with the real world in mind could even include a little bit of that extra time. Easily said, these are all tough to do. Um, taking time out during the day to breathe, to just you know, sort of center yourself. Um, you can do this sometimes in the restroom. <laughs> 
it's, you know, it's kind of quiet in there sometimes. You know, um, another thing you can do is uh, take a, a picture. We have pictures of our family, by the way, and I encourage us to move the pictures of our family around on our desk because you get used to seeing them in the same place and you don't see them. But if you move your spouse or your kids or someone to another part of the desk, they look better. It's like, oh, there they are. And you can also bring in pictures of yourself on vacation or those places. And I've done that, so I have on my bulletin board so a beautiful place that I've been. And every once in a while, I can just sort of go to that place. You know, I look at the picture, and I remember being there. Well, you know, I try to think about it, close my eyes for just a second, think of what it was like, what were the breezes like, what was, you know, was it cold, was it warm, spend some time in that place. Those of us who can, some people have an easier job at doing that than others, but that can be good. Taking some time out, doing a walk, walk around the block, or as my colleague does, run from Mount Zion out here to Mission Bay. That's pretty impressive. That's taking time. So we've talked about values. We've now talked about managing time. I want to talk a little bit about managing negative moods, uh, this depression, particularly anger, a focus on anger. Um, and this is an important emotion. One should, you know, it's, it's, it's a natural emotion we, we need that. It's, it's, it's relevant to certain situations. It, there are times when anger is important. Um, it's OK to get angry to, about injustice, yes. Very, very important. You know, there, you know, we, all of us have those things about which, you know, I'm not going to say never get angry. But our problem is, particularly when we're running, uh, that can get us to a place where we are at risk for getting irritated. You remember back in the type, way back when I was talking about type A and I talked about time urgency and hostility. The time urgency, those of us who've studied this in a more qualitative way, what happens is people are trying to do too much. And it's when you're trying to do too much that it can set up situations where the anger can flare. Um, sometimes also trying to do too much, you don't get it all done well, and that can, you're, you're not as pleased with yourself, and it can also create you know, that, those kinds of conflicts. So, so there's a link between trying to get everything done and being super efficient and getting into the grocery store and getting in and out quickly and everything going perfectly, and it doesn't, and getting angry. So yes, I'm going to say it's OK. Those things that are really important to you, anger is OK. I'm not saying don't ever get angry. But we get angry at traffic. You know, it could be this morning on 101, they decided it was a good time to start striping the road, you know? And so here we are in rush hour traffic, and these two trucks are out there, and they're, you know, freshening up the stripe. Well, great, good timing. And, and they were actually joking about it on the radio. This is probably not the ideal time to do that, but, you know, that's what it was. Um, this happens you know, spilling your coffee all over your desk. Or um, it is interesting that when you go to the copier machine, it's like out of paper. You know, these are the things. That I used to talk about, you know, there was typewriter ribbon, and I'll never forget one time I said, why did I only run out of typewriter, the thing that was the, the thing in the IBM Selectric? Why did that only run out when I was typing? Well, of course it does, because you're typing, and it runs out then. But these things happen. Paper runs, you know, things, you know, uh, you know, at just low tone or all that stuff. But that's not worth uh, elevating your risk for heart disease. So you need to monitor and pay some attention. When is it that I get irritable? And you know, is it because I'm tired? What are some of the triggers? Is it because I'm running behind? I'm trying to do too much so that I'm, I'm feeling some time pressure. And there is, um, it's important also to sort of you know, look at it. And, and there's a myth about anger and feeling frustrated that um, it's really a myth, and that is that we think that an event occurs and it makes us angry. People talk about that. It made me angry. And um, the fact is, is that's not really what happens. What happens is something occurs, and it goes through our personal attitudes, our filters, our appraisals, and, because it, and, and maybe because we're running behind, it's, the, an event occurs, it's happened out there, and then we choose to get angry. Sometimes you might see something. You can see a misunderstanding. Something occurs, and a person responds and gets really angry about it. And you can see what happened. And you say, oh, you know, this, this is a misunderstanding. Well, a lot of us get irritated or angry because something occurred. Um, 
you know, I, I remember, you know, once in my life um, that I was feeling very frustrated, um, and I was wrong. I was, you know, driving uh, and behind, and it was driving behind someone who was just taking forever and ever and ever to get into a parking space. And I was in a hurry. I thought I could just do this quickly, and I just thought this person is not, you know, not thinking. They're not. They're selfish. And then I just, you know, in this, in an instant, so I was feeling all the self-righteousness, and I, I'm ashamed to say this, but I had all the self-righteousness about, you know, the better thing to do is just go around and park your car, and then you get more exercise, and I'm, and it's because I was running behind. And then I noticed they were pulling into a handicapped spot. And it shows you, you know, when that happens, one goes from anger to shame in a nanosecond. It is so fast. And now whenever I'm driving in parking lots, I never get upset at anybody. It doesn't matter. I just, because I learned my lesson. But you also learn your lesson that you can be so self-righteous and so sure and so strong and so powerful. And then you get new information because for me, I, that's not acceptable to me. You know, because I just, that's, it was, I was very upset with myself. There's, that event should not have caused me to have all that self-righteousness. And I share it with you just because I think we, all of us have these times that that happens. And so some events are like invitations that are on beautiful stationery, you know, with hand lettering. They are such good events to try to draw us and make us angry. But you, you, can, you have some choices there. So you have to b look at the benefits and the costs of getting angry. And a lot of times the costs are not so great. And in fact, in my, so my earlier research, we actually had um, an anger recall task um, that we used when I was doing research down at Stanford with some colleagues. And we, people had this special imaging of their heart. And they would do a treadmill exercise, and they would get their heart pumping and pumping so they could see how does the heart do when a person's really exercising. And they could see, oh, that's not good. But our anger recall task was actually worse than this maximal exercise test, where we, would, we, we had to learn something, though. You couldn't have somebody tell a story about an, an event that made them angry that was resolved, because it's then kind of like a joke. They know they're going to get to the end, and it's all going to work out. So we wanted them to talk about something that was unresolved, that still got to them. So we had these people after the, they would do their treadmill thing, and then we'd have them do this, this and we rotated which one they did first. And they did this anger recall task. And the left ventricular dysfunction was greater in that than it was in the treadmill. We could never actually duplicate this study because it was so risky for people to do it. Um, they do do this now in other studies, but we were doing this in a group of people that had some pretty severe heart disease. Um, so it has costs that when people get angry, there are, it has effects on the heart. So you have to weigh that out. Um, and we, we actually have studied that it's adrenaline, and we know the kind of whole pathway of how that occurs. So it does mean, hmm, driving in a parking lot or whatever it is that you're doing, or you're you, know, you get to the airlines, and the snow has come, and your flight is canceled. You know, it happens, you know, yelling at the person, you know, the airline representative, you know, is, it's not going to help. Uh, so you have to consider your options. You can express the anger. You can hold the anger in. Neither of those is optimal. Um, the other is to let it go. Save your anger for the things that are really worth it for yourself. And so this is, you know, it's, it's really slowing down thinking about these things and realizing that event doesn't make you angry. It could be beautifully, it's an invitation to get angry, but you can, you, you can really make that decision and you have that personal filter to use. So another option is sometimes you just, you know, laugh about things, you know, that, you know, here we are and, you know, the, think of the people, we're so lucky living where some of us do live here in San Francisco because we have colleagues around the world that right now have snow that is, you know, piling up on them. So, you know, we, we're lucky here for that. And I'm hoping that some of those people aren't getting too angry at the snow. Uh, but here's humor. Uh, you know, it's, there's, I love this one of my favorite cartoons where the fellow on the right is looking at the fellow on the left and going, oh, bummer of a birthmark, Hal. You know, not so good. These two deer, these are Larson cartoons. I think he doesn't do those anymore. So we've now clarified values. We're, we've talked about managing time. We've talked about 
events and negative moods and really doing some, uh, particularly the anger, the choice there. And now I'd like to talk about the breath, one breath at a time. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some science that I'm doing on stress and breathing that's related to women. It's interesting that um, there's, a, we all know about the fight or flight response. That is, you know, when a major, you know, a tiger is coming, you, you can either fight the tiger or you can run from the tiger. You know, there actually is a third response, and it's the freeze response. And that is, you know, to just freeze. Freeze is common. Like, heaven forbid, this room started to shake. What we would all do is we'd stop, we'd freeze and go, what is that? And there's this vigilance that we engage in, and that's the freeze response, a vigilance. What's going on? Do, you know, you're assessing. And I'll talk some about that, because during vigilance, something happens, um, and that is that we stop breathing. Breathing, you know, and this is my, we, you know, we can't say why is that happening, because it's, it's an automatic response. And we stop breathing, I think in part because we're trying to attend, we're being vigilant, and breathing is noisy. So, um, but there's, um, and your vigilance is also something some of us do when we're working on our computers. Uh, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but you're going, come on, come on, come on, come on. And when I noticed, and uh, I know this because I've been studying breathing, so I have these monitors monitoring my breathing that when I'm doing that, I'm not breathing. I'm just going, come on, come on, come on, come on, you know, come on. And I'm getting impatient. Not good. Uh, so what's happening there? This is a, a, an interesting way of managing, it's our response to stress. It turns out that vigilance is um, an adaptive response because what happens is it elevates the CO2, you know, not breathing. If you don't exhale, your CO2 levels go up, and that can increase cerebral blood flow. So that may be in part why they do that. You may notice if you watch the Olympics, there's a skiing, and then they stop and shoot with rifles. And people that are they're skiing, and it's a cross-country skiing, I think, and then they put their skis down, and they have to grab this rifle or pull it. I think they have it on their backs. And then they stop, and they all take a breath, and then they hold their breath, and they, you know, it's target shooting. And then they have to get up and start skiing again. Uh, and people that do that, and people are focusing and doing that very vigilant, they will take a breath, and they hold their breath. Very interesting. So uh, this breathing becomes important. So uh, a number of investigators thought, well, is psychological stress associated with inhibited breathing in people? And there's a whole line of research on this. Um, and it turns out that there are trends here, and they're stronger in women than in men. They're present in men, but it's more common in women, which, you know, we, it's, this is a stretch, but maybe you know, that, that freeze response might be something that's a little more common in women than men. Some of you are in my era. We used to watch Tarzan movies, and there's this famous Tarzan movie where Jane just, you know, she, there's a lion. I think it's a lion. And she then just lies down and plays dead. And then Tarzan, of course, comes and saves her. Uh, so let's look at um, some, this work. As I said, remember I'd talk about coronary heart disease, and I'd also talk about inhibited breathing. In this, we did a study on of 278 women, and just looking at their resting breathing frequency um, and, and the association with stress. And we found that the higher stress women, women that reported more stress, actually were, had a lower breathing frequency than did women who reported the lower levels of perceived stress. They were more relaxed. They're just breathing regularly in and out. The others are going, come on, come on, come on, come on. I got to send that email to my good colleague. Um, so, and this, their significant, their relationship is there, but it was more significant in women than in men. Is perceived stress associated, and that was the scale we used, perceived stress, feeling stressed, seeing that life is stressful for them. Is it associated with inhibited breathing? Yes more significantly in women than men, is inhibited breathing. You know, I talked about that, fr that freeze response and that vigilance. Vigilance seems to be associated with CO2 levels going up, less breathing, and you get that cerebral blood flow. Well, what if a person does this more habitually? Is that is inhibited breathing um, associated with increased CO2 in women kind of in everyday life? 
And so we looked again at a large cohort of women and men, and we were looking now at breathing frequency and end tidal CO2, and that is exhaled CO2. And that's done by measuring with a cannula. The, you know, you've probably seen some people that are on oxygen, and that's when they're getting oxygen. Sometimes people are, that are in the recovery room will have a cannula, and they, they can measure oxygen levels elsewhere. They may be looking at the CO2 levels, because that gives them an index of the breathing, how things are going. Um, and what we found here, low breathing frequency is associated with higher levels of expired CO2. So people that habitually breathe you know, less are going to have this higher CO2 levels. And we did find that stronger in women, the association there is in men, but it's not as strong, actually, even though that um, men, when they have a high breathing frequency, have almost very um, low levels of CO2. What really started to intrigue um, my colleagues and I was that there's also an association between these elevated CO2 levels, high levels of carbon dioxide in exhaled um, air, and blood pressure, particularly in women, um, in looking at samples, that 10% of the variance of systolic blood pressure, that's that first number, the higher number, 10% of that in postmenopausal women is accounted for by CO2 levels in looking at some of the analyses. And the relationship, and how I got interested in this, is somebody said, you know, let's look at inhibited anger like that. Nothing's wrong. I'm perfectly fine. I'm not breathing. You know, I'm holding my tight. I'm holding this all in because I don't want to express anything. That that actually turned out in a large scale uh, sample of people in the Baltimore longitudinal aging sample that that was really associated. That kind of style of inhibited anger was associated with higher levels of CO2 and higher blood pressure, mostly in women, not in men. So it's kind of this is really intriguing. What's going on here? Um, so. Uh, if inhibited breathing is a factor in some forms of hypertension, and I don't think it is in all forms, but is inhibited breathing related to the development of hypertension, then training people to avoid breath holding might actually be an effective way to help lower blood pressure. Breathing, just really breathing. And so we actually have an NIH grant where we're studying this to see if we could take people who are at pre-hypertension, particularly women, so we're studying all women, uh, only women, and we're seeing if we can train them in breathing patterns or give them biofeedback that they're holding their breath and seeing whether or not their 24-hour blood pressures go down. So we train them in this, we have them practice that, but what we assess are what are 24 automatic, you know, 24 hour blood pressures where you wear a cuff and it's taking your blood pressure all day for 24 hours. So we measure them at the beginning. They have prehypertension or hypertension and not on medication. And then they are trained in this, tech, this approach, getting this biofeedback, or in some cases, they get mindful breathing training. And then we look at them later, 24 hours, and see if the blood pressures are coming down. Very, very intriguing. Um, findings. So it's too soon to tell, but it looks kind of promising, but very interesting in some of our pilot work. So it suggests that maybe for some people that elevated blood pressure is associated. So one of the questions we always said is how is the stress getting into the body? And I described the heart when it was, you know, the, the heart, the, ha what happened with the heart disease patients when they gave the anger recall test. We're also seeing that this kind of a tendency to underbreathe or inhibit breathing, not breathe as like a baby breathes. Remember, if you see little babies lying there and little tummies are going up and down, almost their whole body is moving because they're just so relaxed. This like accordion is stretching and going down. Many of us don't do that in everyday life. We might do it when we sleep, but a lot of times, especially for women, we're worried about sucking in and all of that. So. There, is there an association between not inhibited breathing and, and being able to keep blood pressures lower? Could we take people who are hypertensive or at risk for hypertension and teach them breathing? That's what we're looking at. But if you look, many of the behavioral interventions that were used for hypertension that are effective but not that effective, um, there's, some are very promising, but it was never enough to compete with the medications. Relaxation training is one. 
I actually did a randomized trial, but we used what was called progressive muscle relaxation training. And this is when I was working at Stanford Research Institute. When I realized the issue about breath holding, it was one of those moments where you just go, oh no. Because in progressive muscle relaxation, which is a great technique, what we would do is train people. We'd say, you know, you get them comfortable in a recliner and they'll tense your arms, tense, now hold your breath. We told them to hold their breath and now let go. And actually, if you don't have high blood pressure, if this is an issue for you, that's a really good way. Take one muscle group at a time, you know, tense your muscles in your neck, hold your breath, you know, take in a deep breath, hold those muscles tense, and now let go. That would work except if you're trying to lower blood pressure. And that's what we used. We got some effects, but they were muted and we couldn't, we were frustrated that we weren't able to get lower blood pressure down as much as we would have liked. But that, but breathing was a part of that. Um, coping interventions, many coping studies will involve teaching people breathing techniques. Meditation, there are some pretty impressive results on meditation, particularly um, some people that have done work with transcendental meditation, recent work on mindful breathing, uh, which is part of mindfulness-based stress reduction, that that there's you know, some suggestions that that could be effective. But if we could understand these, what we call the mechanisms, if it is indeed that people are under breathing, then we really need to teach people to breathe, not just at a certain rate, but it's the depth. And in fact, the physicians in the audience know that we, the reason that expired CO2 is helpful is it's not just the breath, because you can breathe slowly, but just be doing it. I'm breathing slowly, but I am only just up here. There's no abdominal breathing. So it's rate by the depth, if you will, and then your metabolic activity. And this expired CO2 puts all those together for you. But there's a lot of hints that there might be something there. So that's the research I'm doing is, is really looking at breath. Um, because it's very, very important. It's actually sort of fundamental. Uh, what is the first thing we do when we're born? We have some people from OBGYN here, and they would, you know, the, it's that cry. Um, and if we don't do it right away, we get helped uh, with a little spank there. And it is, you know, it's at the end of life. It is so basic. Uh, one of my colleagues who was working at the National Institutes on Aging, as this work unfolded, the, um, some of the scientists were saying, this is kind of striking because it was right in front of us all the time. But we weren't really focusing on that in looking at cardiovascular disease and stress. We looked at the endocrine system a great deal. We, were, we haven't looked as much at respiratory system. Could be very important. Uh, so now what I'd like to do in the minutes we have left and then we'll have time for questions is I'm going to talk about a, a breathe. And I've given you all a card to keep. Um, and there are probably some extras out there that you can feel free to take. Because I'm going to try to wrap all of what I've said into this word. And then you have the card there to take with you. The B is for breathe. You know, it is to you know, take in one of those long breaths and then exhale. Be like that little baby. Uh, some people can follow their breath. And if you just relax, breath is something you can try to control. But it's many times, if you just relax, your body will breathe for you. And mindful breathing is really letting your body breathe for you and you just follow the breath. Some people, when they try to do that, get all worried that they're not doing it right. Um, and so for those people, sometimes it's good to think about something really relaxing, like just watching the, the, you know, the water and the ocean come onto the sand and then go off the sand. Or watching the wind and wheat as the wind comes this way and then that way, something kind of an image thing. But the idea is to just, when you're totally relaxed, when there's no one around, just that kind of breathing and to really let yourself do that. And you, if you learn meditation and there's wonderful things, you can just, um, in a search engine, put in meditation and you can, there'll be things you can click on that will guide you. Three minute ones, uh, UCLA has some great ones. You know, there's these little brief snippets that will teach you some of these techniques. Uh, so B is for breathe. Breathe during the day. 
breathe at the stoplights. I have all kinds of little triggers that remind me. A colleague of mine says, do it every time you put your hand on a doorknob. Every, you know, every door you open, um, that's a chance to take a breath. So take a deep breath, and at that time, be present in the moment. Just be there. Like you're here, your feet are on the ground, you're sitting in a comfortable chair, you're here, feel yourself being here. And you can do that. And that can bring down some of the stress. Um, one, one, of the, one of the nice meditations is to, your breathing in your mind can be like the sky. And our thoughts are like clouds in the sky. And the thought will come to you when you're sitting quietly just breathing. And then you can let that cloud just pass away. And when your mind is blank, it's just the sky. So we can do that. Then there's R, realistic goals. This is that part of the time management that I mentioned. We need to set realistic goals for this moment, this hour. You're here in this class. And I hope you're getting a few tidbits that you can take back and use. Uh, so that's a realistic goal. And then when you set realistic goals for the day, the one thing I really want to make sure I do today is, and then celebrate that you did that. But if we have our long to-do list that has everything we're ever supposed to do on that, including you know income taxes since this is March and the time this is being aired, and we all know that April is coming, you, know, you put every single thing down. You're also maybe buying gifts for the holidays. You know, it's too much. So what can you really do What are, with a key goal? And when we have meetings, one thing I'm really trying to focus on is what is the goal for this meeting? Be clear about that and then celebrate that, yes, we got that piece done. So be realistic. This has to do with the time urgency and that overload that I talked about before. So I'm linking these to what I said before. E, everyday events. We have not talked a lot about positive mood. That's another lecture, actually. There's a lot of this about negative mood. But notice things that happen in everyday life that are positive. Um, the sunset. Um, as I was driving over, the moon was, it's a full moon, and it was just, it's one of those moons that there's a certain time during the day when they look really big, you know, it's just like, and I just noticed that, noticing the flowers. Um, outside this, the, one of these buildings here, there's cactus growing and all kinds of, you know, I just noticing that, just noticing it. Um, and then the other thing to do is share that event with others. You know, I've just shared that with you. Um, one time, when I uh, was caring for someone who was very, very sick, and I was coming out of the, um, at Mount Zion at the cancer center, I was feeling sort of da down. And all of a sudden, walking toward me was this little Minnie Mouse person. And it was like maybe after Halloween, I think, and it was one of, you know how little kids want to still wear their little outfits, you know. And this it was just, you know, and I had to sort of, I, I forced my, that is the cutest thing. She was just adorable, this little girl and her little Minnie Mouse. And it was probably November 1st or something. She just didn't want to take it off. And you, it's, I love that about Halloween. These kids, you know, it's Safeway and these little Spider-Men still running around because they just love that. And it was, I, now I've shared that with you. And you've all, some of you are wondering, oh, what is Minnie Mouse? Is he, she had the polka dotted skirt. And, you know, so I've shared that with you. I'm reliving it, and I'm hoping I'm sharing it with you. Uh, so that's something you can do. You can even... Um, you know, tell someone that, you know, you, you, you know you, you, that's a really good color on you. And when it is, you know, just you see those things, mention it to people. So that's everyday events. Now, you might be wondering, why the tire? Okay, this is for me. And that is you've got to notice when things go right. And we all have had, how many people have experienced a flat tire sometime in their lives? Most of you have. Okay, it's really bad because you only notice the flat tire when you need to get into the car to drive somewhere. And it's like, it's not good. So what I do, I try to do this every day, is when I get outside, and I will do that this evening, I will go over to my tire and I go, yes, <laughs> this is a great day <laughs> because I do not have to figure out. I, in fact, I had this... Prius and I, I'm not even, you know, I was there when they showed me how to do, I have no clue at this point because, you know, I was kind of excited about getting my car. So I don't think I paid any attention to whatever is in the sub trunk of the sub trunk or something. I know there's in, something in there. So you have all kinds of opportunities. When you get the mail, no bills, maybe just ads, not bad. 
you know, uh, no, nothing from the IRS. This is a great day. But what we do is we don't notice that. Days go by that, you know, of course, right now we need rain here in San Francisco this year. And so, you know, now we want rain. But, you know, we just sort of take for granted when days, you know, are lovely. So I want you to notice everyday events, even when, you know, notice when things are right. Um, like, none of us seem to have really bad colds, for example. And you know when you have a cold, you say, I can't wait till I can breathe again. Well, many of us are breathing. We're doing pretty good. So you should go, hey, this is good. You know, I don't have a cold. I can taste the food. A is acts of kindness. And I've already mentioned one of those where you can create positive events for people. You can say nice t things to them. You can do acts of kindness. Um, if you're in the supermarket and there's a mom and she's got kids and she's got the basket and they put, you know, the, the, she can't get in the aisle that doesn't have candy and so now the kids want candy because it's like, you know, 645 and you've got a small basket because, you know, you've just got to pick up a few things. You can let the, the mom go first. And that's an act of kindness because nobody does that, you know. And, um, you know, the checker will look at you and they, they will say, good Samaritan on aisle three, you know, because this is just not done. So you can do things like let people in when, in when you're driving. It, you know, do it with a flourish, you know, and thank people. But it's just, you know, we could do so much more of that. And actually, uh, that affects us. Acts of, you know, acts of kindness make us feel better. So you can do that. Not everything goes well. And so we need to also sometimes turn negative events around. Find the silver lining in things. You know, that if something goes wrong, you think, I'll never do this again. You know, I can learn lessons from this. Uh, there's a wonderful person, Michael J. Fox, has found an incredible silver lining. He was a wonderful actor who developed Parkinson's disease. He's formed uh, the Michael J. Fox Foundation and has raised millions of dollars so that many of us know much more about Parkinson's disease than we ever did before. And he's funding research, and it, that's really a wonderful thing. So when negative things happen, so, you know, they did happen, and it's sad, but you know, it's to try to find that silver lining when you can. It's sometimes tough, and I'll say that, but we can always, you know, we can always learn. So that's the T, turn negatives around. The H can be really honoring your strengths. You know, that's some people like, that's a good H, acknowledging your own personal strengths. Take time to go something good about you that is sort of your, something you feel close. Another is humor. And so I let you have a choice there. Um, but I think that there's, it's fun to laugh, and it's fun to do fun things. Go to funny movies, you know, you know, let yourself go every once in a while, even if it's just music from, you know, that era when you, some of us used to dance and nobody's around and they start playing it on KQED during the oldies but goodies. You can get up and just laugh at yourself and kind of dance around. Have fun. Uh, do things that are fun. Uh, you know, whatever's fun for you. You know, can, it, each one of us is different, but I, I think so you have cho choices there for your age. And E is end the day with gratitude. That's, we talked about that before, the, the idea of journaling. But at the end of the day, one of the last things to do is note the positive steps of things that you've done that you're thankful for or do what I call positive accounting at the end of the day, as opposed to what a lot of us academics do. And it's like, oh, as we're leaving the office, it's like, oh, I can't believe I didn't get that done. Oh my gosh, I'll have to do that tonight. And, oh, I didn't get, I gotta write that down, I'll do it first thing in the morning. And we're just sort of this bag of this to-do list that we're just sort of pulling along all the time. And we just take it right into bed with us. So at the end of the day, what did you do that was good? And just highlight that. And that's, you can keep a gratitude diary, which is another thing. So we've got breathe, realistic um, goals, um, everyday events, notice everyday events that are good, um, acts of kindness, I hope I'm doing this right, turn negative events around, um, either just honor yourself and take a moment or the humor and then end each day with gratitude. So to this evening what we've done is we've talked about breathe, to, we've talked about ways that you can care for yourself, build your resilience, and one way to do that is to really think about what you value and kind of maybe make some adjustments in how you spend your time so it's a little more aligned with your values. Manage your time because that can set you up for some of these negative things that occur and breathe. 
So I just want to end there and say thank you very much. And um, we have time for some questions. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Um, I, the question was, do we have any data that studies people who are engaging in uh, things like Tai Chi and yoga compared to people who don't engage in those behaviors? And do, would we see that they're he um, physiologically healthier? And I think the answer to that is yes. You know, um, most of the time what we're trying to do would be to work with those people that are not as healthy to try to find ways that they could change their lives that fit with them. Um, and you were in the question, the person questioning this or asking this question also mentioned neighborhoods because I think there are neighborhoods in around every major city in the United States where there's a great deal of stress. Um, I, in, you know, we actually, in doing some of that work in neighborhoods and in communities, we've encountered post-traumatic stress disorder just living in that neighborhood. Um, and sometimes some of the lifestyles that people are engaged in are, there's just so much to do. One would be learning Tai Chi and yoga. Sometimes what we need to do is go into that neighborhood and work with the community, find out what the community wants to do, but maybe some of the things they might want to do would be to have more stores that have healthy food and food that they could afford. Um, there are neighborhoods where it's not safe to be out um, at early in the morning doing Tai Chi. You know, you just can't do that. So th these problems are really, um, you know, are complicated. But we, uh, and there is a tendency that the, there are people who um, have had healthy lifestyles and so they, you know, been gauging that for some time. Uh, you know, may, if you compared those two groups, they would appear healthier. What we're interested in is what can we, you know, you know what is going to help people in these other conditions lead a healthier lifestyle? And really part of that, though, is learning more about those lives and understanding what are some of the factors that are having, where we have actually unhealthy neighborhoods. And some of that is what we call structural. It's, it's not just the behavior, but it's, it's more, there's some things about the environment. And I have a lot of colleagues who focus on that, and those are called structural interventions, like making safe places for people to meet and to talk to one another and to do that chai chi or the yoga and having those, those opportunities available at low cost. So those are lots of points to that. Any other questions or comments? Yes. The question um, was a really good one that we were talking about um, breathing and inhibited breathing being related to perhaps elevated blood pressure. And other, when we're talking about cardiovascular fitness where we care a lot about blood pressure, exercise is, is, appears to be lowers risk. And exercise is a really, really effective and important behavior for people to do um, to, to remain, to be healthy. And uh, you know, one of the best exercises is walking. And I don't, it, it is very interesting that one of the things that happens when people exercise, particularly if we exercise the way instructors tell us to do that, is to breathe. And actually just walking, one of the things that is, occurs is that when you're walking, you're breathing more. So it would be very interesting to use some of these newer monitors uh, to actually look at those kinds of things, um, to look at blood flow associated with exercise. Um, there are issues, and um, this is not my area of expertise, but exercise physiologists are very concerned because some of us, when we're doing uh, calisthenics, for example, we hold our breath. And they're always, if you watch any of these programs where they're teaching you to do exercise, they are reminding you to breathe because many of us, when we're doing push-ups or even women's push-ups, uh, you know, we have a tendency to hold our breath, which is not what they want. And they, what they do is they try to teach you how to breathe with your exercising. And walking is a wonderful exercise, as is running. Um, but you, you can just, and when people walk, they will be breathing more. One of our studies that um, some of us are at the Osher Center are involved, involved in was bringing exercise to people with moderate cognitive decline, seeing if some of the yoga, some breathing, and also some exercise, you know, that was for, you know, in, that was done in groups. This is work that was done by Deborah Barnes and Wolf Mailing and others. They put these people with cognitive decline in a group in a circle so they could see one another. And they engaged in exercise 
uh, sometimes standing, learning how to get out of a chair. Um, but they always began, and there were a lot of there was yoga moves embedded in that work. And what was very exciting is they were trying to prevent progression, of in pr actually to prolong independence. But what they showed, what um, Dr. Barnes found, was they improved cognitive function. And so we're now trying to discover, you know, what was was some of that improving blood flow, and that's you know further studies. So you're right on a hot topic. I've got a couple questions here. Um, yes, and this is a really good. And I'm glad you brought this up. She, a person who has been practicing Tai Chi and her mother practiced Tai practiced Tai Chi, and. If you go to Taiwan, go to Japan, you'll see people engaging in Tai Chi. Why has this not caught on more here? Um, which is a really good question. I, I think it, it's, you know, it's sort of a cultural thing. Uh, people can you, can, you can get videotapes training. There's training online to do Tai Chi. You can get training at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine here at UCSF. We have Tai Chi classes. And there's actually been inc very interesting research done by Russell Phillips at Harvard teaching Tai Chi to people with congestive heart failure and with significant improvements. Um, and, in, so, and I think there's some of this work has also been done at University of California in San Diego. So I think it's something that could be, it would be wonderful if it did catch on more because it is a, it's a movement pattern that involves breathing, but it's sort of, it has nice because there's sort of a, there's a movement that tends to have meaning to it. So one can get kind of focusing on that, focusing on breathing, focusing on their movement, balance. It's very good in, in promoting balance, which they've also done with seniors. And at the same time, it has the story so you, one doesn't get bored because you're very involved in trying to go through that story, which gives you a set period of time that you're doing it. So I think, you know, it's, I don't know why it hasn't caught on more, but I think it, it would be wonderful it did. Okay. The, this, um, the person in the audience is talking about how in Tai Chi, all the movement is opposites, a yin and a yang. And, and it's done at the same time, which is indeed true. And she's wondering, uh, and there may be research on that that I don't know. Looking neurologically at what is happening, um, we are getting such better tools to sort of study what's happening in the brain, what is happening in the body when people engage in movement. So I, th I think, you know, it's, I, I encourage everyone to take some classes uh, because it's, it's also, for some of us, it's really good for balance. As we see some, and as we get older, that's really important. Um, there was a question here. Yes. The question is, is there any numeric factor that becomes a health risk in terms of the frequency of getting angry? I don't, I'm afraid I don't know of one. I think all of us from time to time have those occasional outbursts. Uh, in the research that some of us did with people who had um, this more type A behavior pattern, it was pretty marked. Uh, and was the higher risk people, it was really noticeable that um, they're, they're, and I'll revert back to the type A world, these were people even in their cars were like studying the, the cars in front of them, sort of planning, it was sort of like a you know, pinball game of where they're gonna drive and oh, there's a man with a hat, they're always really slow, I'll never forget, that was in one of the interviews, it was like, and, and so, and they're like honking their horn and it was pretty continuous for the people that were at the higher levels. But that's a wonderful question, are there quantitative measures? Um, you know, I, um, the one thing I would always say is, you know, the happiness, is, you know, is, is I, you know, we, we can focus on the anger, but the other is to try to increase the extent to which we're appreciating. Um, you know, w with these award ceremonies, you know, when you see people getting awards, we should give lots of awards to people. You know, people never have heart attacks when they're getting awards. <laughs> I've noticed that. Um, so, but uh, those would be interesting things. Any other comments or questions? Okay, one last one, yes. I, let me just mention, the, the question was, you know, is, we're all encouraged to drink a lot of water during the day, and, and many of us don't do that. Um, but there is, you know, there are recommendations, and I'm going to quickly ask Mike, what is the current recommendation for, like, two liters a day? Eight, I think it's eight large glasses of water kind of comes to mind. 
Yeah, and so um, that is healthy, and we should all do that. Hydrating is important and sort of flushes out the system. And I think some of us don't do that because we don't take the time or it, it creates issues for us trying to, but, yeah. She's, this person is saying she's bought a really nice glass. The relationship with water and retaining uh, or drinking water and hypertension is a little bit uh, complicated. So I don't know that we have uh, studies that would say consuming more water is associated with lower blood pressure. It's kind of complicated because, in fact, if people eat a high-salt diet and they drink a lot of water, then their volumes can go up. So one of the approaches to hypertension, aside from breathing, is medications that actually um, you basically eliminate that diuretics, that eliminate that, bring the volume down. That's one approach. Um, so you, you have one option is diuretics to bring the volume down, or maybe, you know, if our research from, you know, is positive, we could suggest some other things to try as an initial step would be the breathing. But for all of us in general, it's good to hydrate. Um, so I want to thank you. I'll say thank you again for being here and being such a wonderful audience and hope that you have learned how to outsmart stress one breath at a time. Thank you. Thank you.